I know, it's very uncomfortable. Six oh one. What time you got? Yeah. All right. All ready? Okay. Today is May the fourth, and we have um, we will call the city of Carrollton's mayor and council meeting to order. We'll have our pledge of allegiance. If everybody will stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. If y'all want to remain standing, we'll have our invocation given by our finance director, Mr. Jim Triplett. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you. We thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for the many blessings of life that you've given us. And even in these times, Lord, of challenge, we admit to you and confess that we are a blessed nation, a blessed people, and we thank you for that, Lord. Fathers, we continue to go through this unprecedented time of dealing with this virus and all of the, the consequences and the trials and the tribulations that it has brought us. God, we thank you for those on the front line that are working God, not only the doctors and the nurses, but the first responders, anybody that has a part in helping this country still run, we thank you for them. We ask your hedge of protection be continued to be upon us. We ask, Lord, for your healing to be brought upon our land, our community. And God, for all of us that are involved, Lord, the mayor and the city council, our state government, our federal government, we ask you, God, to give wisdom, discernment, that right decisions would be made, and we ask and trust in you, Lord, that healing be brought to our land. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Um, before we get to the citizens' comments, I just want to say to everybody how much I appreciate the dedication that our employees and our staff has had during these very trying times. Um, you've heard me say it's very uncharted waters. I don't think any of us uh, in this room or probably anybody listening to us has ever been through um, the, these kind of times before. I know there's been probably issues and things that we've had to deal with, but nothing ever to this magnitude. And I just want to express my appreciation uh, to, to our staff and employees for the job they've done. Um, the other thing is, is I'm, I'm asking the citizens tonight, you know, this is not over. It didn't end at 11.59 Thursday night. Um, there's still a lot of people out there. Um, <clears throat> and they're not taking those precautions that the governor uh, made the stipulations for so I'm asking you to really think about you know still your necessity trips <clears throat> and you know we, we all want the economy to bounce back and we all want everybody's job to bounce back and and that's very important so I do appreciate you know uh, the the positives that we've had from this and I you know, my heart goes out to the small business owners and people that have, have um, suffered during these times, have lost their jobs, and for those things, I, I am truly sorry. And, you know, n there's nothing more than we want to people to get back to normalcy, and I, I'm not sure what that's going to be now. But anyway, I just, I just wanted to say that um, to, to everybody that's listening. Um, we are having our meeting. We have, um, I know you can't see, but we do have everybody staggered. Uh, it looks kind of funny to, to look out there and see it. Um, Erica made the comment about a teacher, and it kind of reminds me of that when you've been in trouble at school and you get spaced out. 
Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about, just for a minute, when I ran for office, um, one of my platforms was beautification and revitalization. Well, I have a letter from a young lady. Her name is Margaret Ayers, and she wrote this letter to me as an activity that she was working on for school. And she lives um, over on Morningside Drive, and she says, Dear Mayor, I love how beautiful Carrollton is, but I would love to see less litter on the street, and I am wondering what are you doing going to do about the litter on the streets? And what can I do to help? Well, you know, I love it when, you know, people point out that there's an issue, and then I love it when they're willing to help. But, Margaret, I will tell you that, you know, um, we had only been here for a short period of time and had a lot on our agendas to get started, but the litter is a big concern for me, and, um, I've been walking some, and I, I have noticed that there is a lot of litter. And uh, I'm encouraging people, if you see somebody littering, get their tag number. Report it to our police department. Uh, there is a fine for littering, and, you know, we can enforce that. So, Margaret, I'm going to be contacting you, and we're going to work on this project together to see if we can't do something about the littering in Carrollton. All right, at this time, we're going to open it up to citizens' comments. We have um, outside uh, availability um, to get the comments for anybody that wants to make comments to the mayor and council. And we also have, um, you're available to call in um, to get your um, comments if you'd like. Is this the number they need to call? Phone. Okay, it's 678-390-6933, and then the extensions 2233. Okay, so we don't have any citizens out there. Okay, all right. Um, so now I'll, um, we have the minutes from the last meetings which includes March 2nd, March 12th, March 18th, March 22nd, and March 25th. So do I hear a motion to adopt those minutes has been presented? I'd make a motion to approve those. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. Hearing none, motion carries. Okay. I guess I jumped a little bit ahead, but making my comments. But anyway, I'll open it up now if the council members would like to make any comments. <laughs> I believe those are in the public comment section of the Well, thank you guys. I appreciate that. Not unexpected. <laughs> Any other comments? with lots of I too would like to thank all the city employees that have been continuing to work through this uh, very trying time and um, thank the staff immensely for all the work that they've put forth to keep our city running at a good pace uh, that we're not um, you know going to be picking up from ground zero when all this is over, that we're going to be in good shape as far as 
um, how our city's been uh, run during this time, and I'm just thankful for all of all the employees for the city of Carrollton, especially our first responders, our police force, and our fire department, and others that uh, have, you know, that put their lives on the line every day. Thank you very much. I'll second that. Um, great job, folks. Okay. Mr. Bruiser? I would echo what the mayor and council said about the employees, and I'm I also want to point out uh, just the great job the sanitation workers have done. There's been a lot of work. We staggered those crews. Those are folks that don't get a lot of uh, attention or positive attention, but they've really done a great job uh, working shorthanded, and uh, it's good to have them all back and and hopefully get caught up on brush and debris and hopefully uh, about mid-May start back the recycling program. But, uh, again, the police and the fire and just everybody – that's been here. A lot of you folks that are out there in the audience right now, we appreciate, you know, what all these managers have done. And, and uh, you know, uh, the mayor and I spoke the other day of just what good shape this city's in and how many cities are struggling. And we're just very thankful that we're not in that situation that uh, certainly there's going to be a, a slight dip in revenue, but it's not going to be, uh, you know, a, a great impact to us. And uh, we're just very thankful for that. So, Appreciate all that you do, and appreciate the support of the mayor and council. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda for items of consideration? I'll make a motion that we approve the items under agenda for consideration. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second. All right. Erica, you want to please come forward and tell us about the site plan amendment request? to touch anything uh, the first item on the agenda is a site plan amendment at Maple Street Commons uh, you guys reviewed this at your work session in March uh, we missed our April meeting uh, the site plan amendment is to basically subdivide one of the commercial out parcels um, it's the one at the corner um, as you enter the main entrance of the development it's currently 1.32 acres the intention is to subdivide the out parcels to create two commercial parcels um, the Planning Commission reviewed this uh, item in March and they did recommend approval of the site plan amendment I'm not going to go through each of the existing uh, binding architectural standards but if you look at your uh, green sheets you'll see A through K um, in the conditions or existing architectural standards um, that would apply to this property um, are both the two new properties uh, should you approve it and then L um, is the additional uh, recommendation which is to only allow retail sales service and restaurants uh, to be permitted on these two lots if you turn to page 21 in your packets uh, you'll see the site the concept plan uh, what is shown is basically a restaurant and a proposed service use like a bank uh, the one thing that we may have to do is we may have to flip those two uses when we get into plans review. Um, a lot of it's going to depend on the stacking for the fast food restaurant, if that's indeed what goes there. Uh, but the plan itself, the lots itself, will look similar to what you see on page 21. If you have any uh, questions, I'm here to answer them. There's one gentleman that uh, the chief mentioned, I think an adjacent property owner that wants to come and speak in favor of it. Uh, when, I guess, Taylor, did I come in? Uh, that's going to be calling. I think John Denny's out there. Yeah. Sure. I don't. I don't think the property owner came or the applicant came. I think it's just an adjacent property owner. John owns the corner that's the sign at Maple Street Commons. Uh, that small corner that Haley's circling around right now. So. Um, this is the mayor and council meeting, and I just want to make sure you understand that you're live, and please state your name and your address, please. Okay. Okay. John, hold on just half a second. All right, now try it. Are you there? Okay, John. Still not the, the 
what you are on the agenda requesting comments on the site plan amendment at 125 Maple Crossing. Yes, sir. Okay. I would just like to speak in favor of that. I have a small adjoining piece of property, and, and I think anything that could be done to help over in that area, bring uh, more business there, it would uh, be helpful to the ones already there and uh, the ones that would come there in the future. Okay. And that's, that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? Yeah, I've I've got a question. Do they do they have a tenant at this point, or is this all just conceptual? The last time we spoke with them, they did they do not have a tenant <clears throat> identified specifically. Okay. Um. I was, I mean, I guess I was just wondering how they decided this, just to split the parcel in half and not have a tenant in mind. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like that we may see this again down the road if someone comes in and, and needs an acre, you know, then they're going to have to come back to us and have us redo or undo what we do tonight. So that's why I was wondering if they did have a tenant at this point. Chuck, could, could <clears> they <throat> include a reversion? If I mean, I guess they don't technically have to split it if it's, I mean, I guess that's a question. I, I mean, is that something they can take care of tonight if for some reason they did want the whole 1.3 acres? Well, I mean, they're asking for a site plan amendment and the entire thing, as I understand it, is a PUD. Uh, and so, Correct. Right. Site, the site plan is binding, so if we amend the site plan, then that becomes binding. So, yeah, they, I, if they were going to configure it in a different way, then they would need to come back before the mayor and council. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess they could just do all parking on one side, but that wouldn't, they would need, that's not going to, they'd need to come back. I mean, that's not going to be. Yeah. You know, one thing that, um, to note, I mean, it, the property could be developed as it is. It would just not be able to be sold to two independent owners. In other uh, words, you can have two commercial buildings on the same lot. Right. Um, you know, with the parking and the improvements and all that sort of thing. And so, you know, I think that the, if you ask the question as to why, I'm assuming it's a marketing thing. Yeah. Um, because the property itself, like I said, it can be sold, I mean, it can be built out without the parcel line you know, the way it is. Right. So. Yeah. I guess I've had some question about why they wanted us to, um, you know, approve a partial split with some definitive, you know, sizes because it's going to be a pretty small parcel. Um, I looked at several uh, other small restaurants today, and they all have a bigger lot. Uh, all the ones that I looked at have a bigger lot than what they'll have for this proposed restaurant. So I don't really have an objection to doing the split. I just think it's a little premature. But um, I, I think, Tommy, I'm going to look at you. Starbucks and the Chipotle lots are both small like this, aren't they? The out parcels, um, the new out parcels at... Uh, Starbucks is tight. probably about this size. Yeah, it's tight for sure. Yeah. So that's a good kind of example of what this might look like. Yeah. On the ground. Yes. Starbucks may be about this size, but um, most of the other, I know the Chipotle site's bigger than this. Um, the Taco Bell out across from um, Walmart is on a larger, larger parcel than this would be, but uh, I guess we'll just, like I said, I don't really have an objection to doing it. I just think it may be a little premature, and we'll be visiting this parcel again down the road, but that's fine. Um, I'm thinking out loud, which is always dangerous. but um, Only when on, you're being recorded. On the existing site plan, it, it's shown as one parcel. Mm -hmm. Does it have the development detail and all that with the parking? No, it's got. it's basically got the uses identified, and so... I mean, you could. That's why I was asking about the if there was some well, sort of flexibility th on the 
property line, like if they could approve the split with flexibility on the line itself? My only thought would be that the mayor and council could approve the development of the parcel either under, under the existing site plan or under the site plan as presented with, with these conditions is, would be to allow at least that much flexibility. But now obviously if they came in with a different configuration than, than what's either there or what they're proposing, they would need to present it. But I think we could provide at least that much flexibility. They can sell both at the same time for the same. Yeah. So I think the motion would be, if you were inclined to do it, would be to accept the Planning Commission's recommendation, but also to allow the developer to develop the parcel under the existing site plan, that they have that option. This doesn't sound to me like it's a time sensitive issue if they don't have a, a tenant or anything. So, um, unless y'all know something I don't know, I, I would. How about if we table it for 30 days? Is there anybody? There's no one here. No, we've tried to keep as many people away as possible. Well, I mean, we didn't, even though we had reviewed this a month and a half ago or whatever we didn't really have this site plan to look at until Friday and um, so that's what made me even question the you know the feasibility of this is I feel like that it is I know that they've they've taken in the setbacks for the building into consideration with their drawing. Um, like I said, I don't have a super big problem with it, but if they're not up against the, um, you know, if they don't have someone that they're working with that it's going to require them to get this on and done quickly, I'd be fine with tabling it for 30 days and maybe ask them a few more questions or get some more information from them about where they actually stand with uh, potential buyers for this, these parcels. I mean, my preference would be that there would be, you know, just because I, <coughs> I would love to see that area develop with, you know, larger scale uh, restaurants or businesses um, myself, and I'm sure probably, Bob, you live out that way, you may feel the same way, or the church may, or if there's, if there's not a rush to do this, I'd be good with tabling it for, for 30 days. Do you have any objections, Bob? Do you want to make that in form of a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll motion, or I'll make a motion that we table uh, agenda item. We have a motion to table the site plan amendment request at 125 Maple Crossing for a parcel split. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, then this item will be tabled at this time. Okay. Um, Ms. Stutter, while we have you here, we have item two, which is a special use permit for 400 College Hill Road, allowing for light manufacturing in general commercial. Yes, um, the applicant, uh, Scott Kaiser, uh, submitted this proposal to allow for a special use permit to do light manufacturing for a metal roofing, metal uh, roofing and siding company. Um, that's behind the, uh, 
that's behind the, uh, the primary uh, commercial use at 400 Cottage Hill Road. The Planning Commission reviewed this at their March meeting um, and they recommended approval uh, with the following conditions. One, the waiver for the extension of the special use permit past 24 months shall be granted. Our UDO currently allows for light manufacturing in a C2 zone, a commercial zone. Um, but it only allows for it for 24 months. That provision was put in place uh, when Superior had their major fire. Uh, so they would like that waived um, so that it can permanently be used. Uh, and then also any future light manufacturing business that's not a, ma a metal roof manufacturing business will have to get their very own special use permit. They'll have to come back before this body and get approval. So it can be a metal roofing company and only a metal roofing company. Uh, you guys reviewed this at your work session in March as well, um, but if you have any questions, I'm here, and I don't believe there's anybody, I don't believe there's anybody here to speak for or against this. Okay. Any questions? On a related note, if y'all notice a sign for this business on the corner of Hayes Mill and Cottage Hill, that would be illegal in the city. That corner is actually in the county, so if you get any complaints on that, it's a good-looking sign. But it's not something we would allow off-site like that. So. Okay. Do we have a motion to grant the special use permit request for 400 College Hill Grove? I'd make a motion to approve that. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the motion's granted. The second we have is Resolution 10-2020, a Unified Development Ordinance uh, Variation. And Ms. Stoddard, would you explain sure. that? Uh, at your March work session, we uh, reviewed this proposed ordinance revision. This is a staff-generated uh, uh, provision or revision I apologize um, it's just something that's come up uh, with the basically people that are trying to redevelop and renovate uh, property and we're working in our blighted housing program trying to encourage people to improve properties but we've kind of handcuffed them in certain ways um, the UDO currently allows for the or, uh, kind of ordinary routine and maintenance as long as it doesn't exceed 10 percent um, of the uh, current fair market value if the property is a non-conforming structure um, now that can be a house that might be zoned put in like a uh, light industrial zone. Uh, there's several of those near Avenue A and Avenue B and Avenue C. Um, it could be a lot that doesn't meet the minimum lot standards. Um, and that 10% is really not enough um, if someone's coming in and trying to do a significant renovation. Um, it also states that the cubic content of the structure cannot be increased. Um, and this is so that we are able to basically over time get rid of nonconforming uses. Um, staff would like uh, to revise the ordinance so that we remove that 10% limitation um, and we allow them to put um, additional funding towards the house or towards the properties um, and then also give the city manager discretion um, to waive that 50% limit limitation on reconstructing damaged properties um, at, of, of nonconforming structures. So those two things, so removing that 10% amount maximum amount you can spend and then also give the city manager discretion in allowing non-conforming structures that have been damaged say by like a tornado or a tree falling on it give him the discretion to be able to allow them to come in and renovate those properties if it's damaged by more than 50 percent the planning commission did not review this one this is not one that actually has to go to the planning commission okay so i have no recommendation for you okay well i i just know that when you start renovating uh, is we talked about in our blighted housing is you know with old structures <laughs> when you get in you never know what's going to be there and what kind of damage and even if you you said you know it's only going to be 10 percent then you get in there and you find there's more more damage or there's you know water damage under a tub or something I you know I, I think 10 percent is kind of low but especially if it's been you know considered blighted housing or you know, housing that maybe has not been maintained. But I'll entertain any discussion. Do y'all have any questions? When did this effective last update uh, It would have been 2007. I don't think this one, Chuck, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think this one's been touched since they adopted the UDO in 2007, correct? 
I don't I don't remember some a change but since then. Mayor, I'm going to recuse myself from the discussion here since I'm part owner in a property that probably would fall within this guideline. So. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I think it makes uh, I think it makes good sense to do this, and I'd like to make a motion to to uh, go ahead and approve resolution ten dash twenty twenty. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. And we'll note for the minutes that um, Councilman Ledbetter has uh, recused himself. So. Um, no further discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same sign. Hearing none, then we will um, do. We will uh, allow for the unified development ordinance to be amended to include those um, same updates that we've just spoke about. Okay, our next one is Resolution 11 2020, which is small cell ordinance. Ordinance, I'm sorry. And I think we're going to let you elaborate a little bit on this. Thank you, Mayor Kaysen. Uh We discussed this at the work session, but if you recall, in 2019, the Georgia General Assembly uh, enacted and the governor signed into law what's known as the Georgia Streamlining Wireless Facilities and Antennas Act. And the whole point of the statute was essentially to streamline the deployment of wireless broadband throughout the state of Georgia. And in doing so, basically what the, the state government did is they essentially limited what local governments can do to control, you know, these small cell facilities, even within city-owned rights-of-way. Um, that's not to say that we're toothless but it really, it really limited what we're able to do. So in response to that, uh, GMA came up with a model ordinance that local governments could adopt, and we discussed that at some length at the March meeting, um, I mean, at the work session. But since then, we discovered, working with staff, Tommy, Randy, Erica, Haley, that Cobb County adopted an ordinance in September of last year that we really liked better. Um, it's more straightforward, it's streamlined, and uh, it frankly, I think, gives local con as much local control as you could expect to get under the statute. So what we're actually presenting to you tonight is substantially similar to what Cobb County adopted last year. And just hit, to hit the highlights, um, essentially the way it works is when a provider comes in to put in either a small cell facility or a new pole, they have to get a permit from the city to do so. There is a, an application fee that's set by the statute. Um, this ordinance provides for a preference first for co-location. And if you can't co-locate, then a preference for locating on an existing pole. And if there's not an existing pole, then the third option would be to install a new pole. Um, and they have to then certify to the city that they've at least gone through the process of exploring co-location. Um, we can charge an annual fee. That annual fee is also set by statute. There are maximum size and height requirements that are also um, in the statute. What we liked about the Cobb ordinance, though, that was a little bit different from the model ordinance is they actually have a fairly good list of development standards relating to these things. And they go ahead and say that to the extent possible, you've got to make this thing look like something that blends into the environment. Uh, to the extent possible, you've got to screen this thing. Um, and so there was, there was a little bit more teeth, if you will, in what Cobb County had done. So that's why I'm, that's what we're presenting to you tonight instead of the model ordinance that we went through in the work session back in March. Mr. Connerly, would you estimate how many polls this group would want to put up in our city? I, I'll tell you, all what, what we can tell you, Tommy, is, is the application we have gotten so far. So this, this statute went into law became law in in the summer last year 
And so since that time, we've been getting applications, but we've held off on processing those applications until we had our ordinance in place. Tommy, what have we gotten so far? Do you remember? Any estimate about what it might look like in five years or Is there any limit on the application of how many locations, or is each location stand on its own? Um, each location stands on its own, but now they can, subject to certain limits, submit like a consolidated application. So they wouldn't, it, they can come in and apply for multiple poles or multiple small cell facilities as part of one application, one application subject to, to certain limitations. Yeah. Chuck, on this part where it talks about the um, portions of covered poles and, you know, this kind of thing. I know we're in the process right now of, you know, we're working on Bankhead Corridor. We're moving to Alabama Street, We've moved, and we're going to move to Maple Street. And one of the things Eric and I have talked about a lot is the poles relocating them or you know what what's what's the what's our limit basically because we don't we want it to fit into the streetscapes so that it doesn't take away and I know that uh, you know I've seen and I th it, it probably was in Cobb County where they had to make it into a tree to fit into the neighborhood what is there does this really outline I know it's got a small point about it um, but not a lot I guess or did I just miss something yeah if you look um, in proposed section 5.06.08 B it says that all small wireless facilities shall incorporate concealment elements to the maximum extent feasible and as appropriate to the site and type of facility and to the extent uh, permissible by law. And then it goes on to talk about camouflage design mm -hmm. techniques. So it's going to, a lot of it's going to depend on the particular application and where they're proposing the pole. Um, I think staff will have some discretion in terms of, you know, what would be appropriate given the proposed location. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, if, if, if we deem that something needs to be screened or concealed in a certain way and we won't approve the application without them doing it, and if they say, well, you're exceeding your authority under the statute or under your ordinance, then it may very well be that a judge has to decide at that point, you know, but we, we do have some discretion in terms of how we administer our own um, ordinances. And I, to credit Cobb County and whoever drafted this, I think that's probably about as much detail as you could include, yeah. considering the fact that every, uh, every location is going to be different. Some are going to be residential, some are going to be commercial, some are going to have existing trees, some are not going to have existing trees, and I think they've tried to provide as much flexibility as they can. Well, and I know there's some areas in town that have already went to the expense of underground wiring, you know, bearing wires, so um, I just want to, I mean, this, this is part of just, I guess, my personal preference here is that you know, I want us to get a much, as much away from that as possible to add more poles uh, to take away from the aesthetics of uh, the streetscapes and things that people have, you know, really um, invested a lot of money in doing. So I, um, okay, so that's fine. Does anybody else have any questions? 
I, I, I kind of feel like that I read over this pretty thoroughly mm -hmm. and um, that it gives us about as much teeth as Chuck would call it as, as we possibly could have. And unfortunately, um, you know, this was a decision that came down from the state level uh, several several years ago and uh, or last year well it started really in 2018 okay. um, and the ACCG the county organization and GMA got together and <clears throat> the General Assembly wound up not passing anything in 2018 and they worked over the next year to come up with a compromise legislation which was presented uh, in 2019 adopted and then signed into law last summer I mean, there's a reason why it was controversial. I mean, yeah. You know, there's a reason why a lot of local governments didn't like it. Yeah. But, you know, the, the wireless industry and lobby is pretty powerful, too. And right. so what you're seeing is, is prob you know, a, essentially a compromise. Yeah. Uh, it may help you feeling some. We, when I got here and Tommy got here and I came in 04, I think Tommy came in 05, but the uh, cable companies were – notorious for running cable anywhere in any corridor of the right of way and mm -hmm. they'd be on top of our water line or they'd hit our sewer line or they'd bore through it or whatever or uh, and we police that pretty hard so we've got a pretty tough permitting process and tommy's got a pretty good staff that does that i'm gonna assume they'll be just as tough on these poles and they'll fight it just as hard so this carrollton's got a reputation for making other utilities behave and again, we want to be reasonable. We don't want to create conflict just to create it. But I think that you know you can count on Tommy and uh, Rick Grant and Randy Williams and those folks, you know, staying on top of this as best that the law will allow. Well, and and I don't want anybody to take away from here that I'm saying I don't want wireless because I do. I know during this COVID-19, there's been lots of areas that. You know, children have not been able to do their work because they don't have wireless access. So I'm very much in favor of being able to produce wireless access to any and everybody. So hopefully, um, I, I want to make sure that people understand that that's my position. But I also know, as, as Tim has said, if you're not careful, uh, these companies will come in and, and I, you know, I agree it's a good ordinance. I just um, hate to see any more poles going up anywhere on our right-of-ways that we don't have to have. So do we have a motion to um, adopt the resolution 11-2020 small sale ordinance? I'll, I'll make a motion that we adopt the small cell ordinance as it's been presented to us tonight. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. The next item on the agenda is a board appointment for Carrollton's Visitors Bureau. It we have Ms. April with us to talk about that. Hello, good evening. Um, yes, we have a vacancy on our Carrollton Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, it's a lodging position that was previously held by Ryan Krull, who was the basically general manager of the Marriott Courtyard, and he left for another position. Um, our CVB board met, and we request that you guys consider appointing Christina Wood. Um, she's the sales director for the Carriott, Carrollton Marriott Courtyard and the Hampton Inn. Um, she has been a great asset to our board and just working with her indirectly um, for the events and, and different things that we, bids that we put out and all those kinds of things. And so um, she's who we sent um, for appointment. And if you guys did appoint her, her term would be effective immediately and would continue through June 30th um, of 2021. At that time, she would be eligible for reappointment um, to a three-year term uh, to the CVB without limitation. Okay. How many people are on that board? Um, right now, we've got, our president is Mike Hart, um, and then we have about seven other of us, including myself, on the board. Um, and certain positions are allocated for certain 
um, types of folks. So like, for example, this one is lodging. We have uh, one that's for restaurants and, you know, then different um, folks on behalf of the city. Anybody have any other recommendations for this position? Okay. So do I have a motion to appoint Christina Wood at, to the Carrollton Visitors Bureau? So moved. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll make the second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. Okay, the next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is board appointment for the <coughs> Board of Developmental Development Appeals. Uh, we have two positions on that. Is that right, Ms. Stutter? Yes, uh, two that it, they actually expired in April, but we didn't have the April meeting. Okay. Uh, Hugh Bass um, is currently our vice chair, and he served on the board since 2012. Uh, most of y'all know Hugh, but he's an appraiser, local appraiser here in town. And then Peggy Philpot uh, Patterson is a realtor uh, with Commercial Realty uh, Services of West Georgia. Uh, she. Uh, was appointed in uh, 2014. Both have expressed a willingness to serve. Both uh, have really good attendance, and they um, contribute greatly. That, that's a great board. Um, all of them are. Uh, and uh, we, at this time, recommend that they be reappointed. Okay. We have. Oh, and their term will go until March of 2023 if you reappoint them tonight. All right. So we have two recommendations for the Board of Development Appeals, that being Hugh Bass and Peggy Philpot Patterson. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. Is there any further discussion? I think we're lucky to have uh, such excellent people serve. I, I agree with you, Bob. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say, uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Okay, well, is there any other business? Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.